We're going to begin this morning with some of the deadly clashes at Venezuela's border. Sources say at least five people are dead. More than 285 are injured. Venezuelan uh, security forces fought with protesters near the Colombian border, and Venezuelan President Nicolas uh, Maduro is still clinging to power, has cut ties with Colombia now, and is stopping the opposition leader, Juan Guaido, from bringing aid into the country. In response, Guaido urging people not to be loyal to those that, quote, burn medicine and food in front of the sick and hungry. So far, the main flashpoint has been the bridge, which connects Venezuela to Colombia. Saturday, the Venezuelan National Guard scattered protesters with tear gas and rubber bullets, and nearly all trucks carrying supplies were either blocked or burned. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo slammed Nicolas Maduro, tweeting, what kind of a sick tyrant stops food from getting to hungry people? The images of burning trucks filled with aid are sickening. Let's get to CNN senior international correspondent Nick Payton Walsh. He is in Colombia where a lot of that violence broke out yesterday. Good morning, Nick. What are you seeing there this morning? Well, those border crossings will be closed today and tomorrow while they take stock of the damage done here in Colombia. That's one of the busiest crossings, frankly. It's been a lifeline to hungry Venezuelans in the past years to get food in to them. Yesterday's humanitarian aid bid Obviously, that appears to have failed. Some say that perhaps, cynically, the organisers got what they wanted with those terrifying scenes of clashes there. There's an obvious sign the Maduro government would do little to help its own people. Five killed, we're hearing. But importantly, too, 60 Venezuelan soldiers defected during that violence. Here's some of the scenes we saw yesterday. I should warn you, there are some troubling images here. As a new dawn, when the opposition planned waves of Venezuelan refugees would simply take aid back into their homeland across the busiest border bridge with Colombia. But it was closed, blocked physically by Venezuelan riot police and behind them violent pro-government gangs. The young police taunted or begged into changing sides. I'm Venezuelan, she says, holding up her ID, and my father was a sergeant. How will you stop me crossing? But they were Venezuelans too, and also knew its collapse, its hunger, and here, the heat and thirst. The water you're drinking, she says, it's Colombian because your president doesn't give you any. Bring him out here to us. I eat or drink soda whenever I want here, he says, but the hardest pain is how my grandfather died because he didn't have medicine. For a brief moment, the anger dissipated. The police lowered their shields, talked calmly, but down the road, the promised aid convoy arrived in a huge crowd, intent on pushing through. Tension mounting here, the shields have gone back up again, and the protesters are recommending people start to move back. This was why a slow march of opposition protesters. Peaceful in as far as they would not take no for an answer. It fast collapsed into tear gas. The day's lofty goals soon lost in a routine exchange of hatred. Rocks against rubber bullets and rocks thrown back. Did without you expect to have blood on your shirt today? This is the other, other guy with a shirt. But did you expect that to happen today? It's, a, it's the blood of the Venezuela people, it's the blood of the freedom. And as they lost up on the bridge, the protesters took their fight underneath. They are many, but Maduro's police are mightier. They have only whatever they could make. None of this chaos got any aid across here, but it showed the uncompromising ferocity of the Maduro government, and it led throughout the day to Venezuelan soldiers giving themselves up. One here carried out the mobs both cursing and cheering. The opposition had promised defectors amnesty. But this will only get uglier, seen in the mobbing of pro-Madura militia here, battered by the crowd and spared only by Colombian police. 
And if the symbolic bid to get aid in peacefully failed, then these scenes are what Venezuela is left with. The question really is, what for the opposition leader, Juan Guaido? He's no longer in Venezuela. Does that detract from his credibility or in his meeting with US Vice President Mike Pence on Monday in the Colombian capital of Bogota? Will he look more like a leader on the world stage? Those scenes ugly. We'll see more of them, I fear, if these are tried again. We're going to see probably more Venezuelan soldiers defecting. The real issue is, how do you get food into a starving people? None of this standoff has fixed that issue. Back to you. All right, Nick Payton Walsh, thank you so much. Glad you and your, your crew are safe today as well. It was looked a little dicey yesterday. It did indeed, and some heartbreaking images out of there. Thank you, Nick Payton Walsh. Our next guest grew up in Venezuela. He left and came to the United States as a student back in 2016. Yeah. Daniel DiMartino recently wrote an article in USA Today. And in it, he described the living conditions in Venezuela, how socialism destroyed his home, and he is with us this morning. Daniel, thank you for being here. I, 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 your story is so fascinating, and we're going to get to that in just a second. I want to ask you, though, since we're just coming out of those images, what is your reaction to what you have seen in the last 24, 48 hours there in Venezuela? And do you, have, do you still have family there? Are they okay? Maduro, Maduro has shown in the last 24 hours that he's willing to starve his people, to starve my people, uh, to cling in power. And this has just shown and proven the theory that most Venezuelans had that this regime will only get out of power with force, the use of international force. Are you suggesting U.S. military force? Is that what you'd like to see here? I am suggesting that President Guaido on Monday when he meets with Vice President Mike Pence and with all Latin American leaders, he needs to call for an international intervention led by Colombia and Brazil and that the United States must support worldwide diplomatically and rally all the region around this uh, purpose. Because look, Dave and Christy, this, there is no other way out. 300,000 children are going to die in Venezuela if we don't do this, of starvation. 30,000 people are being murdered. There, there's, this is a humanitarian crisis of epic proportions. Daniel, help us understand what it was like for you growing up in Venezuela, for you and your family. Well, uh, my childhood, when I was little, it was definitely much better than now. I, I did have what I needed, but uh, as time progressed, starting in around 2010, when I still ha when I have some memories when I was 11 years old, as well as a little uh, earlier, you could see shortages of food, especially milk, toilet paper. Uh, by the time I left Venezuela, we didn't have electricity at least once a week. Uh, water sometimes went out for weeks long. It, and I was privileged, let me tell you, because I know people who lived in the rural areas instead of the city, Caracas, where I lived, and they sometimes didn't have electricity for weeks. Now people are starving because they don't have even basic food. And that is why. I mean, help, un help people understand why that is under the socialist society. That's, that's exactly right. So the reason for this is that the regime took away most private businesses. They started expropriating land with the excuse that it was being accumulated under a few wealthy people in Venezuela when this was just a lie. Uh, most land was owned by middle class, by just farmers who wanted to produce and, and create wealth for themselves as well. And at the end, the regime closed our borders, just like they're doing right now with the humanitarian aid, and destroyed our private industry. By destroying our private industry with nationalization and price controls, there's just nothing mm. left to eat. Hard to believe given Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the world and has adequate water reserves as well. But I want to ask you about something else you wrote on this US, USA Today column, and that's kind of a word of warning to U.S. political leaders. And uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders, as some of the movement, the shift toward socialist democratic policies here in the United States, how would you warn voters here in this country? Look, there is no further proof of my argument than Bernie Sanders' statements uh, a few days ago when he refused. He refused to say that Nicolás Maduro was a dictator, and he refused to recognize Juan Guaidó as the president of Venezuela, something that even Speaker Nancy Pelosi and other Democrats have done. This is really dangerous, and Democratic primary voters really need to uh, push out these radical Democrats from their party, because not all Democrats are that way. And I really urge uh, bipartisan compromise on this issue, because if we continue Venezuela with socialism, and if we push very radical socialist policies in the United States, uh, the United States might get closer to what we're seeing right now in Venezuela. 
Now, just to be clear, not either Rossi nor Bernie Sanders is pushing for a Venezuelan style of socialism. They want the Green New Deal. They want Medicare for all. But you're just saying that is perhaps a path down that road. But it's great to have your perspective. Daniel DiMartino, thanks so much. Appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for having me.